All right, it is Friday afternoon, the 1st of February, 2019, and we are gathered here at the Texas de Brazil restaurant in the heart of downtown San Antonio, Texas. For the past several years, dating back to 2013, the Super Bowl weekend has also been the weekend of the Texas Backgammon Championships. And since 2015, the Texas Backgammon Championships have been hosting the inductions to the American Backgammon Hall of Fame. And I am Bob Stoller. I am one of the founding sponsors of the U.S. Backgammon Federation. And I serve as the unofficial historian of the U.S. Backgammon Federation. It has been my great privilege to be associated with all of the Hall of Fame inductions going back to 2015. And I am here today to interview the person who will be inducted into the Hall of Fame in about two hours, and that is Steve Sachs of Los Angeles. And I want to say thank you very, very much for agreeing to participate in this interview. Well, thank you for asking me, Bob. It's a pleasure to be here. So what I have tried to do with all of these interviews is go through my archive and find background information and allow my interviewees to comment. And the theme is, for each of the interviewees, it's your life in backgammon. So by way of teeing this up, what I have here is the fall 2017 issue of Primetime Backgammon. I'll hold it up for the camera. This is the now quarterly publication of the U.S. Backgammon Federation. And there's a photograph of Steve in here, which is why I'm holding it up. So on page 24, we have a photograph. It's labeled 71, and we'll talk about that, why it's labeled 71 in a minute. But can you tell us who this young man is <laughs> and what the circumstance was which led to its being snapped? Yeah, well, I had been playing backgammon fairly seriously for a couple of years at that time. And I went to attend a couple of tournaments um, in late 1983, uh, Chicago Open and the uh, Louisville Labor Day backgammon tournament. And so this photo was taken at the Louisville Labor Day Backgammon Tournament, AAA division, which was the highest division. And I don't remember exactly, I remember there were like 37 to 43 players. You know, they, you can't go to Chicago Point and see what the results were for this tournament because this is way before they were keeping track of that kind of stuff. Anyway, so I played in this tournament and, and I won it. It was my first win. You were 22 years old? Yeah, I was a month short of 23 years old, but you could, you know, for embellishment purposes, you could say I was only 22. How long had you been playing backgammon with any seriousness by this point in your life? Okay, that's a good, good question. Um, so there was a backgammon club on Sunset Boulevard in West Hollywood called the Cavendish West, which had been open since the early 70s, and it was a bridge club. Uh, but in the um, actually been open since the probably the 60s at some point and then in the early 70s I don't exactly remember when but maybe 72 73 they introduced backgammon now I was way too young to attend this club because you needed to be over 21 to go to the club and so the day before my 21st birthday I went I showed up at the club and the manager says you're not 21 yet you need to leave and I'm like seriously I'm gonna be 21 in like six hours He's like, all right, yeah, I'll let it go. So basically since I turned 21, and this was not quite being 23, so a little bit less than two years, I've been playing you know, fairly seriously. Had you had a mentor or any mentors in backgammon at that point in your life? Um, you know, I would say the only mentor to that you know, to date would have been my mother because she, uh, she taught me how to play the game, I'm going to guess around 70, 1974, uh, after she and my dad, you know, were playing backgammon at the club. Now, she was a pretty good mentor to have because, you know, uh, not only was she a fine games player, my mother and dad met at a bridge tournament in Chicago in 1959, and, uh, you know, they met, they fell in love, they got married, and I was, you know, arrived. About a, about a year later, and uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, she was a fine backhand player. As a matter of fact, she won the 1980 U.S. 
Women's Backgammon Championship in Reno, Nevada. So she was a very good person to learn from. Now I will note for our audio record, the 71 refers to a photo archive on the Chicago Point website. There was a man named Mike Maxiculi who had started a backgammon publication in Las Vegas. I believe it was called the Las Vegas Backgammon Magazine. And when that magazine stopped publication, Mr. Maxiculi gave custody of 100 photographs from his archive to Bill Davis, Hall of Fame inductee 2015 and proprietor of the Chicago Point website. And this picture that we've been discussing is in that <coughs> Maxiculi archive. It's the 71st of 100 photographs. All right, now, back to the photograph. Do you recall who your opponent was in the finals? Absolutely. Uh, my opponent was uh, Arthur Dickman, who was a bridge and backgammon expert from New York and Florida. Uh, I imagine he was born in the teens sometime. Uh, and uh, he played really, really strong game, you know, even, you know, into his 70s when I played him um, in the finals. Now, the next document that I found in my archive that mentions you that would, I think, be pertinent to this period in your life, this is a publication from Danny Kleinman. This is entitled, How Can I Keep From da Dancing? And this, I believe, is the sixth or seventh in the series of books. Danny was one of our Hall of Fame inductees in 2016. And I was honored to actually do the presentation on his behalf. Now, he started including annotated matches in his publications with this volume. And the second of the annotated matches, which starts on page 76, match two, I'm going to read Danny's introduction. X and O. Should we take a little break? No, I just have this kind of lingering cough that it's just, it's not going to go away, but I'll try and okay. suppress as much as I can. X and O play a 17-point match. O is a savvy old veteran, a well-known East Coast expert. X is Steve Sachs, a fine young Los Angeles player with a natural flair for backgammon and considerable intensity. Now let me hand this over to you. Is this by any chance the transcript of your match with Mr. Dickman from Louisville. I'm fairly certain that it is. I actually, uh, I got a copy of the uh, transcription and I entered it into XG and for those viewers out there who don't know what XG is, it's Extreme Gammon and it's a backgammon analyzer and helps you to study your game and try and improve. And back in, I mean, now, you know, it's very common to, for people to record matches, video record their matches or have them streamed and later analyze them, and it's done in pretty quick fashion. But back then, it was a very rare event for a match to be analyzed. There were no bots whatsoever. This is before... Hold it, hold it. You've used the word bot. For the court reporter who's going to transcribe, the, 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 the spelling is B-O-T, and that's uh, a slang expression for robot, which means computer program. Correct. And so currently, uh, most of the better players are using Extreme Gammon. Prior to that, it was uh, Snowy, and prior to that, it was Jellyfish, and prior to that, it was TD Gammon. And, but that probably only started like in the early 90s, as far yes, as I know. Yes, that, that's right, early 90s, TD Gammon. And, but this was 1983, it was way, way, way before that. And so the odds that a match was even going to be recorded was pretty, pretty rare, although people did take the transcript of the matches and go over it and say like, wow, I wonder, you know, if I did something right or wrong, and they would discuss it with their friends and, you know, uh, competitors. And uh, I had a couple of matches recorded from that uh, tournament. Uh, the finals, of course, <clears throat> would seem like a natural, if there was gonna be a, a match recorded from the tournament, the finals would be a natural place to conclude. But in my fifth round match, played uh, Jersey Jim Pasco, and that match was recorded, and that's in another book of Danny's. Well, I'm not sure which one. Maybe you know. Uh, I was not aware of that. What Danny says in the introduction to many of these matches, he just identifies the players as X and O without giving names, and he explains the reason for that was he didn't want to embarrass anybody. 
The yeah. first person he identified by name was, in fact, you. It's a very rare identification by name, and it's this match, and that's why I flagged it for this interview. Well, maybe in part it's because I don't care if I'm embarrassed. Or secondly, maybe I played so great that uh, there was no embarrassment to be had. And I'm sort of like half kidding and half serious. I, it was amazing that, uh, and this, these numbers for some of the viewers may not mean anything, but if you play under 5.0 and uh, the, the scores in uh, extreme gamma, the lower, lower the better, like golf. If you play under five, that's considered world class. And I've played, I think, a 5.27. For, so for a 22-year-old who really had done nothing more than really uh, read Paul McGreal and Barclay Cook and Joe Dweck's backgammon books, that was pretty amazing. But uh, it might have been an anomaly, so who knows. Anybody who <clears throat> wants to see what Steve was playing like at age 22, this book and that batch is what they should pick up. The book, by the way, is available from Carol Joy Cole in her backgammon boutique. Carol, another one of our Hall of Fame inductees from the original class of 2015. All right, now, it's a bit of a jump before you achieve what I would characterize as verging on world-class competence in backgammon. And your breakthrough year is 2002, but as I was going through the biographical materials I've assembled, it appears to me that there's a lead-up period in starting in March of 2000. So I'm going to hand you a document here. This is the Chicago Point newsletter, number 127, from April of 2000. And this newsletter is the creation of Bill Davis, one of our Hall of Fame inductees, original class of 2015. And the top headline for the camera, I'm in this column here, this is the report on the uh, Pat St. Patrick's Day weekend uh, tournament, the 2000 Midwest Backgammon Championships. And the subheadline says, Sachs edges Ballard, Ballard, B-A-L-L-A-R-D, in Grand Crystal Beaver. So my first question for you is, what is a Grand Crystal Beaver? Well, um, it was actually the trophy awarded and is actually continuing to be awarded uh, now at the Minnesota Backgammon uh, Championships for the jackpot tournament, 16-player jackpot tournament. And what you receive if you win the tournament, which I won twice actually into 2009 as well, uh, is a Swarovski crystal beaver with, and it's on like a mirrored base with like wood surrounding it and a little plaque on the front. So it's a really cool trophy. It's very unique. And uh, I was very glad that Bill put that on. Um, and that was the second one that they had. The first one was in 1999, in which I lost to Harvey Huey, um, famous backgammon player from Texas, probably 11-0. So I had like a little bit of, I won't say revenge or anything, but uh, motivation to try and do better the next time. And, you know, facing off against Knack, one of my all-time backgammon heroes in the finals was... Well, that we, we need to identify. Yes. Knack is Knack Ballard. <clears throat> and do you remember what his ranking was in the Giants ranking at that point? Um, I would imagine it's number one or number two, but I would say probably number one. At well, the he time. was number two. He oh, was okay. The, in the... There is a polling among the top world-class players every two years. The first of these, I believe, started in 1999. And Nat Ballard, the person who Steve beat in this event, was rated by his contemporaries worldwide as the second best backgammon player in the world. He later became the first best backgammon player in the world in this rating. At the time of this, he was number two, and Steve who is not on anybody's radar, has won this event. Now, do you remember what the buy-in was on this event? Check over here. Oh, I mean, I think it was $600, but let's just see. Oh, it was $600. Oh, good memory. <laughs> yes, and what was the top prize? Oh, $6,000. So this was a pretty big deal. You've beaten the world number two in a $600 buy-in event with this uh, remarkable rare trophy. And this gets, I would say, this gets you <coughs> on a lot of people's radar. Yeah, this is, um, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, it's interesting that in 1998, well, 1994, I lost to Hal Heinrich in the finals of the Vegas backgammon tournament, but I didn't win it. And 
So that wouldn't necessarily put me on, necessarily on people's radar, but you know, at least I made the finals. And then in 1998, I played Knack in the finals of the Super Jackpot in Las Vegas. So that was, this was sort of like a Rocky II in 2000. He had beaten me in the finals of the Super Jackpot in 1998. So two years later, you know, back in the training, pounding the meat bags, you know, in the freezer like Stallone did. Uh, yeah, so Rocky II. Let's see if there's a picture here of the trophy. So this continues on page five. So here we have, <gasps> this is a picture of you rolling for in the Grand Crystal Beaver. <laughs> and what does the caption say? You also won the pig rolling competition? Oh yeah, that was a fun, uh, Bill Davis's tournaments were amazing. I mean, he did a production at the you know auction every year. And there was also like fun, crazy games that you would play. And one of them was called pig rolling. I'm not even sure I could really tell you how it worked, but I did win the pig rolling, uh, as well as the Grand Crystal Beaver, so. So livestock is your friend in 2000. Yeah, it's animal farm. <clears throat> now, I also have the parallel issue of Carol Joy Cole's Flint News. <laughs> this also gives you second tier headline, Steve Sachs wins Crystal Beaver. And let's see if there's a picture of that in here. Well, there may be, and I can't find it quickly, so we'll move on, because I have a bunch of other stuff here to look at. <clears throat> All right, so it's now. This is the January-February 2001 edition of the Carol's newsletter, the Flint Area <coughs> Back News. And in her Who's Doing What column, entitled Gambits, this is for the month of February, it says here, Steve Sachs has started a series of five articles entitled Strategic Choices on the GammonVillage.com website. Does that ring a bell? Um, Let's see over here. Well, that's possible that that happened. What, the, it's 2002, and I don't remember writing these articles. I mean, I'm sure that if it's published that it's true. But in 2002, I wrote um, a column, a regular column, uh, called Advanced Angles. So maybe this was the precursor to that. That was my hunch. Yeah, we're <coughs> going to talk about Advanced Angles. In fact, this is now a good time to do that. I have a lot of things to ask you about that. Sure. It starts in 2002, and when I went to the Gammon Village Archive to do research, it turns out you are credited with having written 125 articles in the Advanced Angles series. And I had thought that I would get the Gammon Village people to do a hard copy printout of all of your articles. <coughs> and what they reported back to me was it aggregates to 1,740 letter size pages. That's three and a half reams of paper way more than could be accommodated in the short period of time between when I started my research and this interview date. But I have a present for you. The Gammon Village people made for me to give to you for this event. This is what I believe is called a flash drive or a thumb drive. This is for your computer. This is, I am given to understand, all of your Gammon Village articles. Wow, this is amazing. Very thoughtful of uh, Mel Dragosevitz. I hope I'm pronouncing his last Mel name. Mel and correct. Frank. Mel and Frank are the people who put this together, <clears throat> and this is their gift to you. I appreciate that, and we we saved a tree at the same time. Yes. So here's a little envelope to keep it in safely. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So the heading, the title of the of the column, advanced angles. Does that suggest that you were <clears throat> intending it for players who play at the aspiring intermediate level, what we call advanced? Yeah, I mean, it was basically, the column could be for any, anyone, uh, but my primary, you know, target uh, audience would be players of the, you know, advanced level. I mean, like, that would be like the highlight people that I would want, you know, to be, to benefit from this series of articles, but intermediates or beginners if they wanted to read something, because especially like the first article they wrote was, uh, you know, 10 tips on how to improve your game. <clears throat> so that could have been for any level player. Well, 
we've gotten a wee tad ahead of where I had thought of going, but in fact, here is my handwritten summary of your 10 tips from your first article. The title of the article was Introduction, and this, the publication date was May 21, 2002, and here are your 10 tips as I have summarized them. Number one, read books, and you suggested two authors in particular and to one book in particular, Paul McGreal's classic text, Backgammon, and then, quote, anything by Bill Roberti. Paul McGreal was one of our original inductees in the Hall of Fame in 2015, and Bill Roberti was one of our inductees in the original class of 2015, and Bill Roberti was also the first person I got to interview in this series of interviews. Now, point number two, watch good players play. Point number three, ask good players questions. Point number four, play good players. Point number five, play out of your element. Point number six, get a backgammon analyzer. And I take it you mean one of the computer programs, mm -hmm. what we call the bots, the yes. OT. Number seven, practice often. Number eight, which I particularly like and will come back to at greater length, give instruction to someone below your level. Number nine, set goals and mark your progress. And number 10, have fun. Yeah. Now, looking back from a perspective of 17 years and about to be inducted into the Hall of Fame, is there anything you can think of that you would add to that list? Um, on the spot, not really. I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> I'd say it's a pretty damn good list. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, one thing I would say is, is that um, as far as playing good players, um, it's more easy to do now than it used to be in the past because you could play online and I think they had uh, Fibs back then. I'm not sure they had GamesGrid, but you know, Fibs was the first internet backgammon server and you could play you know, players of all abilities there. And GamesGrid, which is now called GridGam, is another place <clears throat> that you can play. And occasionally, you know, if you're a lower rated player, you could ask, you know, one of the top rated players to play. Now, they probably won't play you a rated match because it would cost them too many points if they lost, but they might play you an unrated match. I've had, you know, some lower rated players ask me to play matches and, you know, I would generally play them unrated match and we'd just have fun and they'd really appreciate it. And that's a good way for uh, you know, someone to achieve actually playing a good player without putting up $600 to play in a jackpot tournament. Now, this point eight, give instruction to someone below your level. Yeah. I've done a fair amount of research and at <coughs> least in Wikipedia land, there's a suggestion that this idea of teaching someone with the idea that you yourself will learn from that experience dates back to Seneca the Younger, whose dates the Wikipedia I looked at suggested 4 BC to 65 AD. The Latin proverb is docendo dissimus, D-I-C-I-M-U-S. We teach so that we ourselves may learn. And you pick up that theme again in your column. <coughs> this is dated March 20, 2007, giving the advanced player a lesson. And here's what you wrote. The point of giving a lesson is not to tell your student what to do, but to ask him or her why they made a particular decision and to go through the thought process behind that decision. And then there's a little ellipsis here. The joy of winning at backgammon comes from giving yourself a challenge and succeeding in that effort. Even if you don't win, but have learned something in the process, that is victory enough. I think that's a great sentiment. Is that there sounds anything great. You... I wish I'd have written that. Oh, I did. <laughs> Losing is an inherent part of the game, and you've got to discipline yourself to accept losses when the dice go against you, when your opponent gets outrageously good dice. <clears throat> How did you develop the mental discipline to deal with that yourself? Well, <laughs> I'm not sure that I really ever have completely gotten used to losing, but you know, 
Backgammon's a lot like baseball. I think the very best players in backgammon win at about the same rate as the very best teams in baseball, Major League Baseball win. You know, you're probably going to win in the low 60% you know, range. Uh, I've been playing at the Gammon Associates Club, and they've been keeping track of the matches, uh, you know, how many you've won or have lost over the years since, I think for about 10 years, and I've won about 63% rate, which is, I couldn't, I couldn't have that rate at the, you know, at the ABT level, not at all. That's probably, that might be 57, 56% or something. But so, you know, depending on the venue of competition, you know, I have experience that I've won, you know, somewhere between like 56 and 63%, maybe averaging in at about 60%, which is, you know, like I said, like, you know, the average good baseball team will win at about at that rate. So, you know, it's just, you have to, you know, if you're gonna win, if you're gonna lose two out of five matches, you know, then losing is going to occur very, very often. You just got to get used to it and learn from your loss, as you know we just talked about. <clears throat> We're going to come back to my notes in a second. <coughs> All right, what I have here is it's May two thousand and one. This is. Carol's Flint newsletter, and you're starting to make waves on the American Backgammon Tour. You're, you're standing at this point, May 2001, you're in third place. Now, you don't go on to achieve major prominence in 2001, that's coming next year, in 2002, yeah. but you're establishing yourself. So, is there a progression that you can recall as you're sitting here? from the Grand Crystal Beaver victory in March 2000 into now 2001? Um, you know, I just think, I, I hope I'm not on the decline uh, as far as my level of play is concerned, uh, but I think just, you know, gradually every year I study more, I learn more, and if I can remember uh, reference positions, and if you'd like me to explain what a reference position Please. is, I can do that. Yeah. Yes. So a reference position is basically any position that can occur in backgammon. Uh, but you don't need to remember every position. You only really need to remember the ones that have importance with respect to uh, your borderline cube decisions. Now I wrote an article called The Equity Continuum, uh, which is, I believe was published in Gammon Village. And what that refers to is the different plot points on an imaginary line uh, regarding uh, you know, the different points at which you might consider a cube. So, it, you know, if this, there's an imaginary line starting at, like, you have an even position, and you move gradually towards the right here, and now you arrive at a position where, okay, this is a center cube. And then if you own the cube, you have to get a little, a little bit stronger. Uh, we don't necessarily need to get into why you need to get to be stronger to redouble than to double, but, you know, the cube has value. And then you get to the point where it's a redouble. And then you go even further down that line to a point where it's a redouble and a pass. And then even the last stop on that line is too good to double, which means you have a you know, significantly better chance to win a gamma than you have to lose the game. So you would actually not redouble, even though if you redoubled, your opponent would drop, just so you can potentially try and win a gamma. So um, back, back to your question, what was your question? Yes, what I'm holding here is now the June 2001 issue of the Flint Backgammon News. This is number 239. <coughs> and on page six, I see an article here entitled The Poker Connection by Steve Sachs. And I believe this is the first article that you wrote for Carol Joy Cole's newsletter. So do you recognize any of that? I sure do. Uh, I remember interviewing uh, all of these players, some of them who are friends of mine, uh, all of them whom I know, and uh, so I just wanted to get a, you know, analysis on their part as to like which was a more difficult game, which game has more luck, which game has more skill, and to see like what are the connections between the players who happen to have talents at both games. Were there any broad conclusions that you drew from this research? Um, actually, it probably raised more questions than answers because they're very, very different games, but they do have similarities. Um, you know, 
generally the, the top players uh, in both games are highly intelligent people. And, uh, you know, one of the people I uh, interviewed was Paul McGrill, and he's, you know, he's a genius, you know. So, <clears throat> uh, actually, when I asked Eric Seidel uh, whether he thought there was more luck in backgammon or poker, he went back and forth a couple of times and says, you know what, I'm, I'm not really sure. So, and I'm not really sure either to this day, because both games are constantly evolving, and, uh, but it was a good examination of like a different game that uh, I'm not as good at. Now, do you play poker with yeah. anything like the intensity you play back at? I would say actually not with the level of success, but I, I'm pretty serious about it. And I do something that I rarely see anybody else do. Although I have heard that Gus Hansen would like, you know, because he wrote a book, uh, Every Hand Played, some, you know, about his win at the uh, Aussie Millions. Uh, and he, you know, talks into a voice recorder uh, about certain hands that he plays. Well, what I do is, when I'm playing back game, and I take pictures of positions, or I'll have the whole match recorded. But that's, you know, when you're playing in a casino, they don't want you, like, recording things, and it's not even of any use, really, to do that. But what I do is I have a piece of paper that I write down, you know, how I play a particular hand from the start to finish, you know, and also the particular tendencies of a player that I'm against, and then I ask, you know, maybe six or seven friends of mine who are good at poker, do I think I, do they think I made the right decision? And invariably, most of the time, they'll say, well, yeah, I, don't th I th wouldn't have played it exactly like you did. And they'll tell me how they would have played it, and that really helps in, in improving my game. So I, I still haven't, you know, gotten to become a winner at poker yet, which is kind of, I don't say embarrassing to say, but, you know, I would hope that... <laughs> as long as I've been playing that I'll be a winner, but uh, I haven't achieved that yet, but, you know, I'm still trying. <clears throat> All right, I now have the October-November 2001 issue of Carol's Newsletter, and one of the things that amazed me when I was looking at this was there's a report on the 7th Japan Open held in Tokyo, October 6th through 8th, 2001. And could you tell me who won the doubles event number eight? Yeah, there were two doubles tournaments. Um, and so uh, a friend of mine, Hugh Sconiers, who was uh, one of my early mentors in backgammon, very, very fine player, great at all, all kinds of games. Uh, I asked him if he would play doubles with me, and we did play doubles, and we won the three matches to win the first doubles tournament, and it was very, very exciting, and the trophy that we got had like a little, you know, ribbon coming off of it. It was a unique trophy. What prompted you to go to Japan to play back then? Well, um, I became friends with Mochi, and... Uh, Hold it, we need to identify Oh, yes. Record. Masayuki Mochi Zuki, I yes. believe is his correct name, known uh -huh. really as Mochi, M-O-C-H-Y. Uh huh. Yeah. So, you know, Mochi, he was a new player at the time. You know, fairly young. He was probably in his, you know, 23 or something like that. And he was very, very good. But he wasn't like at the level he is now. He's probably far and away the number one best player in the world. Uh, there could be arguments to that, but there's no argument. He's not, for you know, absolutely in the top five. And I think he's number one player. <clears throat> anyway, so when he was young, he came to Los Angeles and he played at, uh, you know, the backgammon club. And so I asked him if he wanted to ride home one night. So I, you know, so I gave him a ride home to the hotel he was staying in. It was kind of in a, I wouldn't say a bad neighborhood, but it was a little iffy. And I said, why don't you just stay with me? And he was like, really? And I said, yeah, sure. So he stayed with me for several days before he <clears throat> headed back to Japan. And then uh, <clears throat> he uh, says, why don't you come to the Japan Open? He says, you know, you'll like Tokyo. If you've never been there before, it's like you'll have fun. And the, the motto for the tournament was meet Kenji, eat sushi. And we went out for sushi every night. It was unbelievably good. I mean, you know, so what an experience. And it was Jake Jacobs was in the group and Hugh Sconiers and, <clears throat> you know, other, other, other people. And uh, even, God, I mean, I think Akiko might have been sort of just bursting onto the scene and you know, I've actually went back to study Akiko. Now we need to mention who Akiko is. Absolutely. Two-time world champion, Akiko Yazawa, 
who at the time was Akiko Abe. And if you go back into the Chicago Point to study the uh, <clears throat> results, you'll see uh, maybe it was 2001, 2002, 2003, it was early on, winner, beginner division, Akiko Abe. And I'm like, and like, look where she's come. She's like such a fantastic player and really nice lady and modest and, you know, doesn't brag. But she's like such a fierce competitor and it's like great to know her and Mochi and, uh, and Michi, like they've all become friends of mine. And anyway, so, you know, like I said, Mochi said, why don't you come to Japan and play in the tournament? And I did. And uh, I lost to uh, her eventual husband, uh, Mr. Yazawa, in the second round of the Japan Open. And I lost to Michi in the second round of the jackpot. So, you know, I got to play the winners. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> You've done a fair amount of international play. That was the next thing I wanted to pick up on on this. Yeah. You played not just in the Far East, but also in Europe as well. Yeah, uh, I've been to Europe, I think, four times to play. In 1989, I went to play in the World Championship, and uh, I, lo I beat Paul McGrill, which was the highlight of my career at the time, uh, in the third round of the Super Jackpot. Now, I lost in the fourth round, the money rounds, so I didn't get anything. But, you know, beating Paul McGrill in like, you know, the 13, 11, 15 point match, I don't remember how long it was, but that was very, very exciting. And uh, <clears throat> the next trip I went was, well, I know I went to Paris in 2000. I went to play in three tournaments in 2004, uh, Venice, uh, Monte Carlo, and Cannes. And I cashed in all three of those events, the second and the last chance to uh, Kenji Shimadara, uh, Mi Kenji Tsushi of, of his fame, in the, at Venice. And in Monte Carlo, I got to the, well, I don't even remember. Oh, I got to the round of the eight of the super jackpot, got something for that. And in the Can tournament, I got to the semifinals. It was very, very exciting because they actually had us up on stage. They were recording it and they were presenting the video. And uh, I lost to a fantastic player, Andreas Humke. And he had me crushed. He had me like 10 nothing before I, you know, it was 17 or 19 point match. And I made a valiant effort to come back, but eventually he won uh, and came in second in the tournament. Now we're into your clearly breakout year. And what I've got now is the March 2002 issue of the Flint area back Edmonton. And we have the results of the most recent Giants poll. This is the poll taken in 2001 accountancy and evaluation and tallying of the votes is now complete and published in 2002. Nack Ballard, the person whom you beat to get the Grand Crystal Beaver, is now world number one. And you have appeared for the first time in the top 32. Where are you? Number 20. That was a surprise, but, you know, um, I worked hard and uh, had some achievements and didn't piss off enough people that people wouldn't vote for me, so it worked out. Now, this is just the start of what is going to be your breakthrough year to this moment. Okay. By the way, do you recall where you had been in the 1999 polling? Uh, I don't know, 43rd or something like that? 61st. So oh, 64. Those are the yeah. top 64. Okay. Yeah. So you have jumped 41 places from 61 up to 20. Yeah, that's quite a bit. <clears throat> All right. Now we've got the September. I get out of order. <coughs> September 2001, Chicago Point. And this is, I believe, your first article for Chicago Point. This is a book review. This. Yeah. Um, backhammer with the Giants, Neil Kazaros. Yeah, I remember that one. And How did you come to do this review for Bill Davis? I think, I guess Bill asked me to do it. I'm, I'm not absolutely positive, but I think he asked me to do it. I read the book and, you know, I made some commentary, most of it positive, some of it maybe not as positive. But it's a good read.
This, I believe, is your second article for Carol. This is June 2002. And you have coined a new word, SICK LUCK L. C Y C, capital L, capital U, capital C, capital K, and then A L. That's a cute title. I don't even remember this. <laughs> Now, the what the article is about is backgammon positions, but the introduction talks about your making a hole in one, playing golf oh, yeah. on a local par three golf course with one of your Los Angeles backgammon friends, Clarine. She That's goes correct. by one name. Yes. And it was dusk, and you weren't sure where the ball landed, and you look in the hole, and lo and behold, there it is. So we're going to talk about golf in a little bit more detail, but um, how did you come to do this article? Do you have any recollection at all of this? No, I mean, I, you, it's just, <laughs> um, but actually it was interesting, uh, regarding that hole in one, uh, I was playing with Clarine and, and I was two over par at the time and I actually made the comment, I said, you know what, if I hit a hole in one here, I'll hit even par for the first time ever. She's like, yeah, right, good luck. And it actually happened. I mean, that's like, very weird, but you know, no, but I don't really remember. Uh, I'll have to reread this. This is uh, this would be interesting. Well, I've got all these here for the weekend, so you'll have a chance. Thank to you. Read it. Okay, all right. Now, the, the major breakthrough tournament for you on the American Backgammon Tour happens shortly thereafter. This is the September October issue, 2002 issue of the Flint Area Backgammon News. And what is the top headline here? Sachs is unstoppable at Indiana Open. Karen Davis wins Indy 300. So what was going on here? Okay. Um, in the Chicago Open earlier in that year, I had purchased a, a Taki board. I ordered it at the Midwest Backgammon Championship in 2002 in March, and Taki said, I'll have it ready for you by the Chicago Open. Hold on, we have to pause here. You're referring to TAC? Morioka, T-A-K is the man's first name. Yes. M-O-R-I-O-K-A is his last name. He's Japanese-American <clears throat> ancestry. And he is a master craftsman of fabulous world-class backgammon boards. Known yes. among <clears throat> serious players as Taki boards. Yeah, so his nickname is Taki, or Taki. I'm not sure which how it's pronounced. But anyway, so I purchased a board from him, and he, he always makes this joke. He's a funny, funny guy. And he says... Uh, I guarantee you, the first tournament you use your board at, you'll, you'll, do, you'll, you'll do something. And I'm like, really? Okay. So the first board I used this tournament at was the uh, 2002 Chicago Open. And I got to the finals. I played Jeremy Maguire. It went down to the last game, and Jeremy won. He's a fine, fine player. And so that put me in the hunt for the ABT title if I did something in one of the tournaments later in the year. And so now we arrive at Indiana 2002 and I won all of my matches uh, and I played Perry Gartner in the semifinals and I guess since I made the finals and won the tournament obviously I defeated him and in the finals I played Jim Curtis and it came down to an interesting position where I was four away he was two away and I had three checkers left on my deuce point and he had a checker on my ace point which is uh, most of the people understand what the coup classique is, but you know, for those that don't, it's that if you have three checkers on your deuce and you roll an ace, you'll leave two blots. And if your opponent has a decent board or prime, he could pick up one and the second blot and then win the game. He actually becomes a favorite. So we arrived at that position with me having 12 checkers off, three on the deuce point, <clears throat> and, and so Jim is waiting, you know, and I'm, I'm four away, he's two away, he owns the cube. And Jim is like waiting for me to roll that ace, and I rolled the ace. Except it was double aces. So you don't leave the shot, and you put him on the bar. No, I got to play three checkers from the deuce point to the ace point, took checker off, match over, I won the tournament. It was very exciting. So it was your coup classic. Yeah. It was the counter coup classic. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Well, it turns out that that also made front page headline in the parallel issue of. Chicago Point. So here is this. And there's another picture of you and another picture of Karen with her trophy. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's just actually the same photograph, it appears. But that's fine. Um, one is more cropped. Yeah. Oh, Andy Wynn vaults Sachs into 2002 ABT lead. 
So you're now the top of the American backgammon tour at this point in time in 2002. Right. There are a few more months to go. Mm -hmm. It turns out you emerge as the winner of the American backgammon tour for this year, 2002. But there's something else. You mentioned a tacky board, and there's another person who winds up getting a tacky board, and we're going to talk more about her in a minute. But since I've got the issue immediately handy, do you recognize this person? Oh. <laughs> yes. And who Nic is she? It's Nicole Kidman. She's an actress, and a uh, very fine actress, as a matter of fact. And uh, one of her people, uh, you know, uh, found out of me, about me through possibly Gammon Village or something like that. And they wanted to know if I could give someone a backgammon lesson. But they didn't say who it was for. So I gave a lesson to one of her assistants. And they liked me enough that they said, you know, uh, I got a call from her assistant. Said, uh, you know, could you come and teach Nicole backgammon? I said, sure, I'd be happy to. So at various points in time throughout the year, uh, I gave Nicole um, backgammon lessons, and her uh, assistant said, you know what, we'd really like to get her aboard, you know, just like yours. So they gave me the money for it, or actually, I'm, I don't know, know if it went that way, but uh, I think I just told them where they could purchase it, and they purchased a talkie board for her. And in fact, Bill Davis has a column <coughs> on that, and that solves that mystery. Okay, While good. We're in the neighborhood. This is the Chicago Point number 174, May 2005. And if you would read the passage down here, the bottom of page seven that I've highlighted. Sure. Master craftsman Tak Morioka was approached to build a talkie board for the Cleveland Browns' Jim Brown. Tak has already built special sets for Michael Jordan, Nicole Kidman, Art Benjamin. Oh, uh, yeah. For. And Nicole Kidman. Then there's oh, and that's a that's separate thing. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. So that explains the connection between Nicole Kidman and the tacky board. You were the person who set that up. I, I was. Yeah, it was a beautiful board too. It's like, I think it was like green and blue uh, points, and uh, it was a really really nice board. I've had my tacky. I still use the same tacky board. I've had that for uh, separate separate since 2002. So what, 17 years? Yeah. Almost, 16 and a half years. Okay. We're into November, December of 2002. And we're going to do this quickly. I just want to point out, this is the standings cumulatively through December. And here you are at the top. By the way, who's in second place? Well, the great Ed Laughlin. Yeah, he's uh, currently, I mean, this is, this is 2002, but if you want to j jump forward to like 2019, He's two points ahead of me in all-time ABT. Yes, he is. He has like about 309 points. I have 307. So I'm in fourth place. He's in third place. And of course, you know, the never we'll never be able to catch Ray Fogerlin and Neil Kazaros, who are over 500 each. <clears throat> right. I believe Neil's in first currently, and then Ray's in second. But uh, you know, to be in the top three or four is pretty darn good. <clears throat> Toward the end of the year. You have a good event in Minnesota, and what about that picture? What, what, if anything, do you remember about that? Well, I actually didn't even remember this until you're showing me now. It says that um, I'm holding the trophy. I guess did I win the Masters there? Yes, exactly right. You okay, won the Minnesota I, Masters. I didn't remember it, and and I played for. Oh, Fred Colantre awards. I didn't play in the finals, did I? Or do we even know? Well, it was his tournament. I. May, I probably did not play him in the finals. I don't remember who I played in the finals, but uh, certainly could look it up. <laughs> All right, so we'll move on here. January, February 2003, and the final tally is in for the year of 2002, and there's the article. Steve Sachs is 2002 ABT, that's American Backgammon Tour Player of the Year. And I would say, to this moment, this is the apex of your career. Yeah, I mean, it's extremely difficult to win the ABT. I mean, obviously, someone's going to win it every year, but it's like the Masters Golf Tournament. It's like very, very difficult to win, but somebody's going to win it. And this happened to be my year. And I've come close, you know, a few times since then. I think I came in fourth once and second once. 
but to actually win it, and I'm glad that I did achieve that because uh, there are many, many fine players that have never, I mean, Neil Kazaros is amazing. I think he's won it like six times. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, but just to win it once, it's like, you know, winning an Oscar or you know, hitting a hole in one. Oh, we already did, we already talked about that. In fact, you hit a hole in one twice. Uh, that was the second paragraph in the Sick Luckle. Okay, but since Sick Luckle, I actually had a third hole in one. <laughs> And what I say to people is, I think I'm probably the worst golfer in the world to have three holes in one. I must be, because it's really, really difficult. And anyway, so or I got lucky. I got sick. I got cyclical a third time. <laughs> All right, what do we have here? You start writing columns now. You've got your ongoing column at Gammon Village, <coughs> and in aggregate, 125 of them over a span of, I think, 13 years. Okay. While you're doing that on, on a ca almost monthly basis, originally uh, close to weekly, and then it yeah. tapers down a little, you're writing from time to time, as we've seen for the Flint area newsletter, sure. and for the Chicago Point newsletter. Yeah. And here is another article, and this is one of your trips. This is number 164. May 2004, and it says, I've got a flight to miss. So traveling occasionally has its difficulties. Do you remember anything about this? No. This is like, <laughs> this is crazy. I've got a flight to miss. Uh, you were going to be traveling with Bob Glass, I believe, and you wind up missing the flight and winning the event, as I recall, when you finally get to the venue. Don't remember it at all, but I'll have to reread it later. Okay, well, Thank you. We'll read that later. Okay. We mentioned that you have played in Japan and in Europe. Mm -hmm. Here's an article on travels to Europe. Is the glass, meaning Bob Glass, half empty or half full? Bob and Steve's excellent European adventure. This is Chicago Point, number <coughs> 168, September 2004. Yeah, Bob Glass is a very good friend of mine. And so we went on this uh, trip to go to three different tournaments, to Venice, to Monte Carlo, and then Cannes. You know, three tournaments in three weeks. Uh, and I, I, one of the reasons I wanted to go to the Venice tournament, first of all, I'd, I'd been there once, but I wanted to go a second time. Uh, but it was the idea that I really wanted to try and do well in the World Championship, and that you have a much better chance if you don't just show up you know, and suffer jet lag, like getting there one, two days before the tournament. So I went to Ven the Venice tournament a week prior to Monte Carlo in order to try and get, you know, cure the jet lag by then, and it, it pretty much worked. Uh, so anyway, so on this trip, um, I had fallen asleep on the airplane from LA to New York, and then we had a flight uh, to Venice. Uh, and so I woke up and Bob was eating his meal. And I'm like, where's my meal? And he goes, you fell asleep. I said, well, you, could, you knew I was going to be hungry. Why didn't you? He goes, uh, I said, can you get up, Bob? And he's like, no, I'm eating. And I'm like, come on, Bob, I'm hungry. And I didn't have the, the wherewithal of, uh, to just press the you know, call button to have the flight attendant come over and get me a meal. So I climbed over the, um, you know, the seat divider? Oh, yeah, oh, you know, on the over, uh, you know, and like, so delicately balance myself uh, using the, the chairs. The armrests. The, ar the well, you know, but I had my hands on the, the top of the, of the seat, you know, the, the chairs, and then I was delicately balancing myself, balancing myself, trying to put not too much weight on the, the armrests, and I successfully made it out, went to the back of the plane, asked the flight attendant, you know, I'd like a meal, and she like had one meal left or something. I said, oh, thank you, you know, if you can bring that back. Oh no, I, she gave it to me and let me bring it back. So I set it, I reached across Bob, he still wouldn't get up. And then I uh, uh, tried to balance myself to get, you know, back to my seat and the outer armrest snapped. <laughs> and I fell down, landed on Bob's lap, hit, hit the, uh, the tray, the tray like a springboard pushed, you know, like apples, you know, apple juice and toma toma tomato pasta onto his shirt, and needless to say, he wasn't very happy about that. And that's the picture. Oh. Well, 
that's a picture of Bob, but that's not a picture of what. Uh... Oh, this is the cartoon. That's oh, okay. That's, that's oh. the cartoon there. Oh, I don't. Who wrote that? I didn't even remember that. Okay, that's that's very cool, very interesting. Anyway, Bob has since forgiven me. You know, it's a couple a couple of years ago. All right, <clears throat> we now have Steve winning a Las Vegas Super Jackpot. This is December two thousand four. And you're down here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I played... Uh, I'm trying to think who I played in the tournament, but I know who I played in the finals. I played Joe Sylvester in the finals, and he... Hall of Fame inductee last year. Yes, he, he, he was. And uh, he was uh, quite an innovator of the game, like in the 80s and 90s. And I had never played him before, and was kind of excited to actually play him in the finals. And uh, I remember the first four games of the match was amazing. He doubled me four separate times, and each of the games I turned around and he passed the redouble. So I'm up eight nothing, and he's like a little bit frustrated, which I think I would have been as well if the reverse had been true. But I went on to win the match, and yeah, so I beat one of my. Uh, one of the people I admire, you know, their, their game quite a bit. Beat them in the finals is kind of special. All right, now we've talked about the holes in one, and you're back in Indiana mm -hmm. on a Labor Day weekend. And can you tell me who the person standing next to you is here? And circumstances work. Oh, yeah, this is a funny story. Okay, so for any of you who like golf, uh, there's a competition, a women's golf or international competition called the Solheim Cup. And that's women from a variety of different nations competing against each other. You know, it's like a World Cup, but it's golf and it's, it's for women, women's golf. So my mother knew that uh, the Solheim Cup was going to be held in the same city as was going to be held in Indianapolis uh, for you know, during the same or the same or the next week. It was the next week after uh, the Indiana Open, and she says to me, "Annika Sorensen is the number one player in the world. If you win the Indy Backgammon Tournament and you see her, would you have a picture taken with her?" And I'm like, "What are the odds of that happening? First of all, the odds of me winning the tournament is like one in fifty, let's say." And what are the odds of me seeing Annika, like 500 to 1? So the chance of me actually seeing, winning the tournament and seeing Annika, but it actually happened because I won the tournament and I was getting ready to check out and she was checking in to the same hotel, uh, getting ready to compete in the Solheim Cup. And I, I said, Annika, I said, can I ask you a favor? I said, would you have your picture taken with me? I said, I just, I told her the story, I was honest. I said. I said, my mother said that if I saw, I won the backgammon tournament, I saw you to have your, my picture taken with She says, sure. So she stopped and had a picture taken with me, and it was really kind of cool. What I now have here is Chicago Point 186. This is September of 2006, and you are successful in the doubles with the person that you befouled the shirt of. Oh, yeah. So... What, yeah. if anything, do you remember about this? Um, well, Bob and I, we, we used to travel together. We would play in tournaments, and uh, he kind of sponsored me somewhat. And, you know, but part of the deal was I had to play doubles. Not had to. I got to play doubles with him. He's a very fine player. He's number eight all-time in the ABT points list. And so, you know, Bob and I, we had our successes over the years, and it looks like, reading this, that we did come in first in the doubles tournament. You played successfully and won major prizes with an array of different doubles partners. Mm -hmm. And I've watched a number of doubles matches over the years that I've attended ABT events. It strikes me that it's a different skill set, a slightly different skill set to be a successful doubles pair than it is to be a successful individual player. Do you have any thoughts about that one way or another? It's even more so now than it used to be because doubles events, you know, didn't used to be clocked, and now they generally are, and they should be. <coughs> Otherwise, you know, you know, you might be playing some player team that just talks about, 
you know, how should we play an ace in the bear off here? And the equity difference is very, very minimal. And they're like talking for five minutes about it. It's really not fair. So the doubles tournament should be clocked. And uh, so that's, that's a big difference what's going on is that you have to balance your time budget with how much you want to try to, and that same thing goes true with singles, but you know, in singles at least you totally control what's going on and you know, if your partner um, you know, has a different philosophy on you know, a particular situation, you might come, you know, might, you might have a problem like you know, concluding in the proper time or at least leaving yourself short on time which would decrease your chances of winning. You were unsuccessful in defense of one of your indie titles, but you used the occasion to analyze positions. This is number 187 Chicago Point, October 2006, and your column is Indie Intrigue. Do you have any recollection of that? <clears throat> what year is this now? Uh, what does it say at the bottom? 2006. So. Oh, okay. So yeah, I had won Indy in 2002 and 2005. And uh, outside of Los Angeles, it's the only place I've ever won an ABT tournament, which I'm a little surprised at, but you know, I mean, I, I, th it was, um, uh, what do they call that? The, uh, I'm forgetting. Uh, where you just, you keep playing players of the same record Oh, a Swiss. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, so, so I'm just a little bit tired. Uh, so it was a Swiss tournament. And I've really had a very, very good success level playing in Swiss tournaments. Um, I won the Indy tournament twice, which was Swiss. I won the Vitor Cup twice, which, for those of you who don't know, is a private tournament held in, uh, used to be in La Jolla, now it's Carlsbad, that's held by uh, John Vitor and uh, directed by Patrick Gibson, uh, director of Gammon Associates. And John's father ran a tournament from 1962 to 1981, a private tournament at his house, in which Barclay Cook, famous author, won six times. Hall of Fame inductee in the inaugural class of 2015, although Barclay had passed away by that point. Yeah, and a special quick story about Barclay Cook. You know, I had his book and I read it, and uh, maybe a year or two before he passed away, uh, I actually just called director assistance. I said, do you have Barclay Cook's number in New Jersey. They gave me his number, I called him, and we talked for five or 10 minutes about backgammon and baseball and all different kinds of things. And I said, you know, thank you, and I really think your book has helped me, you know, quite a bit. So I got to talk to Barclay Cook. I never met him, but I got to talk to him. Well, your induction into the Hall of Fame, in a way, is a part of Barclay's legacy. Oh, yeah, now that you think about it, that, that's a good way to put it. Another person with whom you're successful as a doubles <coughs> partner, and this is Chicago Point number 188, November December 2006. And what is the subhead? It says Sachs and Zembic win world doubles, and that is correct. I it was the uh, the title had changed. It was originally called the Pro Am, um, so they held that from 1999 to. Well, uh, I won it in 2006 with Brian, and I think they had it one or two more years after that, but I had played, it was interesting, I had played in this tournament five separate times in the Pro-Am, and every time of the first five times, actually I played it, in six, played it six times, the first five times that I played in this tournament, I lost in the first round with my partner each time, and that was very, very disconcerting. I was like, what's going on here? In 2006, the sixth time, that uh, I played in the World Doubles Championship, uh, which was formerly the Pro-Am. I won the tournament with Brian, and the overall match record of the six tournaments that I played in was four wins and five losses, but one title. <laughs> <clears throat> now, in 2017, I had the honor of doing the introduction for the Hall of Fame induction of uh, Mike Svobodny. And one of the great Mike Svobodny stories is known in gambling land as the man with the $100,000 breasts. Yes. And the person 
who beat Mike in this wager and had breast implants done was a man named Brian Zembeck. And my question is, is it the same Brian Zembeck? Yes, there's, there's only one. <laughs> He's a very talented guy. He can do card tricks. He's a magician and real funny. And How uh, did you team up with him? Uh, you know, Mike said, you know, you guys would be a good pair. He suggested we, we play together, we did. So that's how that happened. Chicago Point. And I want to focus your attention on this passage here from the Who's Doing What amalgamation column. Oh. What does that say? <laughs> it says Steve Sachs, California, suggests a backgammon hall of fame in a recent Gammon Village article and lists possible candidates. Well, as it happens, I've got notes on that article in oh, okay. my research file, and we're going to talk about that now. The article is dated April 20, 2007, and the title is, Who Should Be in a Backgammon Hall of Fame? What prompted you to write that article, do you recall? Well, I've written a variety of different articles over the years, and you know, at some point in time, I felt like I'd ran short of like topics to talk about, which probably really wasn't true, but I did a couple of you know, interesting articles, uh, one of which we may get to, the SALT Index, uh, Women in Backgammon, and then I just thought, you know what? This would be interesting. It's like, let's talk about who should be in a backgammon hall of fame. So I went with well, that. Well, let me, let me tell you who you suggested should be in the backgammon hall of fame. I have very detailed notes, which, <coughs> because we're running short of time here prior to the dinner, which is going to take place in about another 15 minutes, I'm going to go real fast. So here are, in order, the first six names that you suggest of 41 total. Paul McGrill. Mm -hmm. Original class inductee 2015, when we finally get a Hall of Fame. Right. Bill Roberti, original Hall of Fame inductee class of 2015. Danny Kleinman, inducted in the second class 2016. Kent Goulding, original inductee 2015. Number five, Barkley Cook, original inductee 2015. Number six, Kit Woolsey, original inductee 2015. I'm going to skip the next two. Number nine, Walter Trice, original inductee 2015. Number 10, Tim Holland, inductee 2016. I was privileged to do the introduction on that. Number 11, Oswald Jacoby, original inductee class of 2015. Number 12, Mike Senkowitz, original inductee 2015. Number 16 on your list, Nat Ballard, original inductee 2015. Number 18 on your list, Joe Sylvester, inducted last year. Uh, number 19, Malcolm Davis, original inductee 2015. Number 20, Joe Russell, uh, inductee 2017. Uh, and then toward the end, you suggest at 34th place on your list, Neil Kazaros, who by 2015, when he was inducted, was the all-time number one on the ABT. Then 38th on your list, Ray Fogerland, inducted in 2017. 39th on your list, Howard Markowitz, inducted 2016. Number 40, Bill Davis, original inductee 2015. Number 41, Carol Joy Cole, original inductee 2015. To this moment, the only woman in the Hall of Fame, which I think is unfortunate. Yeah. There are many others who should be. Uh, and, Kiko and Mary Hickey come to my mind. Yes, and Liga Nud. Yes, of course, world champion 1981. Exactly right. The only two you missed in your musing were Patrick Gibson, mm -hmm. inducted in 2016, but in 2007, Patrick hadn't really established the credentials that he would in the next decade. Right. And Prince Alexis Obolinsky, inducted in uh, 2018, last year. Right. So, not bad. Now, you yourself, when you wrote this, there was no Hall of Fame. This is a long time in the future. There should be. Did you think as a personal goal, maybe if I keep plugging away, I might myself be worthy of induction into the Hall of Fame? Uh, you know, I, I never really thought about that. I mean, I just thought, like, you know, just keep playing and, win, you know, winning and trying to learn. And, you know, if it happens, it happens. But honestly, it was like, there's nothing I've really, like, thought about that much. 
Okay, well, we're getting real close to the end of our available time. So I'm going to see if there's anything else I want to talk about. Well, you have a record here. You win the Badger Classic, but the record is winning the Crystal Beaver a second time. Mm -hmm. And here is the issue on that. This is number 209, April 2009. I believe to this moment you are the only person to have won the Grand Crystal Beaver twice. Actually, there are two other people who won it twice. Okay. Ray Fogerlin is one, and Yuri Millman is the second one. Ah, okay. So you were the first to have won it for the second time. I believe that's correct, and I don't think either one of those gentlemen has won it three times, but I do believe there are three people that have won it twice. So livestock has been good to you. <laughs> What I skipped over was your having won the Badger Classic in Wisconsin. Yeah, and it's cool because they gave me a nice trophy, but they also gave me like a, like a little toy like Badger, you know, like sort of like just like simulated Badger. Okay. We talked about stealing yourself to deal with losing. And in that regard, you created in your writings for Gammon Village something called the Salt Index. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what is that? Well, you know, I had lost a particularly unlucky game to a friend of mine. And the cube happened to be at a high level. It was at 16. And the chance of me losing the game was something like, you know, 1 in 200 or something. So what I did was I said, well, let me think. If the level of the cube was at a 16, which is 16 times what you normally play for, and the chance of losing the game is 200, if you multiply those two figures together, you get an index of how unlucky you actually were. Because if you just lose a game that's, you know, 10,000 to one, but you're not playing for anything, then who cares? It's just like a funny story. But so anyway, so you multiply the 16 times the 200, and uh, so I came up with uh, an index of eight, is it 8,000? Yeah, 8,000. 8, oh, wait a minute, 16, 3,200, sorry. Bad at math. Even a great player can have a bad day, and you have a column entitled, I, lost, I left my heart in San Francisco and my brain in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, so I played in uh, one of the San Francisco tournaments. This might have been one that Chiva ran, I don't remember for sure. But, uh, or it could have been the US Open, because I believe they had the US Open a couple times in San Francisco. And I didn't feel like I played particularly well, and so like I just, you know, was pretty critical of myself how I played, and I just said, look, I left my brain in Los Angeles, so let's talk about what I did wrong. And uh, I don't remember exactly what positions, you know, occurred, but I'm sure that they were mistakes of a moderate to significant size enough to be worthy of talking about. We talked about women in backgammon briefly, and you have a column in the uh, Gammon Village series on women in backgammon. Let's, for the benefit of future <coughs> Hall of Fame deliberations, talk about some of the women who aren't but are worthy candidates for consideration. Well, we just talked about three of them. We get Liga Nude, Akiko, Yazawa, and Mary Hickey. Uh, Mary Hickey is a two-time U.S. Open champion. Back-to-back. Back-to-back, back to back, yeah. She's a teacher. She's a writer. Uh, she's very, you know, free with giving her knowledge. You know, she's a very popular person. And I think she would be an excellent candidate to be in the Hall of Fame. Akiko Yazawa. Now, there's a difference between, like, suggesting for an American Backhammon Hall of Fame and a World Backhammon Hall of Fame. But there's no World Backhammon Hall of Fame. And if there was, she would certainly be in it. As far as an American Backhammon Hall of Fame, you know, what has she done in the United States? Well, I can tell you one thing that she did. In one year, I don't remember the exact year was, she won not only the Super Jackpot, but, but, but the Las Vegas Open, I believe. And she did it while she wasn't even feeling too well. And uh, she was playing falafel in the finals, and he left a shot, you know, in the last game. And she hit it, and she won that, and she won the title. And it was, it was an amazing accomplishment. And Yukiko is quite exceptional. We have to talk about your victory over falafel. That's something I should bring up. And that was in the first Giants Invitational in May of 2011. Yes. Uh, let me see if I can find the Chicago point on that. I've got it tagged here somewhere. And I've even got the draw tagged as well. And this just shows that even with the 
Festival Corporation. Here we go. A Giant Surprise by Steve Sachs. Yeah, this was, uh, this was an amazing tournament. Uh, it was Rory Pascar was the director. He is a very, very hardworking director. He comes up with all kinds of, you know, multiple events. He had a backgammon Olympiad, you know, subsequent to this. But at this time, he wanted to have the top 16 players in the world play in a 16-player tournament. Let me find you the draw. It's on page six. Yeah. Here's the draw. Okay, so what he didn't quite accomplish getting all of the top 16 players to play, but he did get, you know, you know, anybody that was after 16, like if he got a refusal from someone at like number five, number seven, whatever, then people from the next 16, from 16 to 32 would get invited. And in the end, he probably got, I think he got like 14 of the 16 were in the top 32, I'm not positive, and a couple of more uh, players, including Mary Hickey, who should have been in the Giant 32 by now. Uh, she's come very, very close. Uh, but yeah, so in this tournament, it was best two out of three nine-point matches. And in the first round, I drew uh, Jake Jacobs. And Jake's a very fine player and a great writer, you know, a great storyteller. I got lucky, I beat him a couple matches straight. Then I played Neil Kazaros in the next round. And we split the first two matches. I won the first, he won the second. And then somehow I managed to win the third match to get to the semifinals, where I played Bob Coca, mathematician, uh, and I believe he's a math professor. And I won a couple of matches to get to the finals. And uh, I played Falafel, who along the way had defeated uh, fantastic player Ralph Jonas, who I believe he's won the Nordic Open twice, which is one of the hardest tournaments in the world to win. In the second round, he beat Stick Rice, you know, great player. In, in the semifinals, he beat Michi, uh, who's Michi, uh, Michi Hito Kageyama, also called Michi. In the finals, it was Falafel and I. And he won the first match pretty handily. And in the second match, I was down, I believe, 8-3 to 11. And I was on the bar, and I needed to hit like a fly shot. I think I had a four-number fly shot, either 2-5 or 3-5 would hit him. And if I didn't hit that, he was probably going to cruise to victory and be, you know, the winner of the uh, of that tournament. But I did hit the fly shot and came back to win from down 8-3, and then I won the third match. And but I got to say something about Falafel. You know, he is a former number one uh, giant of backgammon. And when we put the match into, uh, uh, I believe it was Extreme Gammon, he played it a two, and I played it a four. So that's more than twice as good as me. It's not like it's just additive. He played at a level that was like, you know, unheard of. So he's a fantastic player and a great guy. And a recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award, and if I understand correctly, dealing with brain cancer now. Yeah, so, you know, great thoughts. I mean, the best thoughts go out to Falafel. Occasionally, I'll chat with him on Facebook or we'll play a match at Grid Gammon. But I keep in contact with him and just, you know, ask him what's going on. So, you know, my thoughts are with him and, uh, Anyway, that was, that, was quite, that was quite an accomplishment and a big surprise, a giant surprise, actually. <laughs> well, we've, we've been going on for about an hour. I usually wrap these up by saying, is there anything I haven't asked you about that you'd like to talk about? Um, no, I think you're actually a very thorough uh, historian and uh, you asked a lot of questions. This is a little bit like, this is your life. Yes, that's exactly what I had in mind for this. And so, yeah, it was a great pleasure to spend the afternoon with you and talk about all these things. And uh, the next time I get inducted to the Hall of Fame, we'll do it again. No, I'm just kidding. All of you once. <laughs> so thank you, Bob, very much. Thank you very much for taking the time to chat with us. Okay, my pleasure.